heavy, heavy board. The first season of True Detective from 2014 is considered to be one of the best seasons of television ever created. Prestige TV, as it's come to be known, had been going strong for over a decade by the time it came onto the scene, HBO being the pinnacle of it, the network that birthed prestige television and its hour-long drama format. Once again, changing the game when it comes to the high-end TV series they had gained a reputation for. No one had seen anything like this before True Detective came out. It was so unexpected when it came on the scene. A new direction for the prestige dramas that TV lovers had come to know, using A-list actors, movie stars, in a big-budget TV series, was unheard of until this moment in time. No one had seen it before on such a large scale. In fact, as the streamers were beginning to emerge in 2014, it was still considered a downgrade if an A-list Hollywood star appeared in a TV series. That it was somehow less prestigious than being in big budget Hollywood films. True Detective, should be recognized as creating the current format. The show's sole writer and creator, Nick Pizzolatto, was immortalized in television and crime drama history with this project. And to this day, I have to say, rewatching it for this review, the reputation is well deserved, listeners. Pizzolatto did something when he created this show and maintained the creative and artistic integrity of a genre that had been relegated to the NCISs of the world. This elevation of the crime genre for television was sorely needed at the time, as things like NCIS and CSI, both fine shows in their own right, and as I've said before, there is something comforting and challenging in the formulaic crime dramas of network TV. I never bash them as, quote, bad television. But this high-stakes crime drama was nearly revolutionary as it aired that year in 2014 to unsuspecting audiences. Uncensored and raw, harrowing depictions of the gritty underbelly of America formerly only reserved for a select number of R-rated crime movies and pulp novels. These types of stories, often dismissed by critics of literature and film as cheap or less than, until Pizzolatto came on the scene with True Detective. Formerly a novelist and staff writer on AMC's The Killing, Another highly underrated television series I recommend to everyone, particularly the first season, Pizzolatto was able to get the budget and marketing, and of course the right network, to make this dazzling depiction of southern Louisiana a reality. Rewatching the show was absolutely enthralling. I couldn't help but binge it for hours at a time, half forgetting what was going to happen and, of course, the minor details coming back to me as I watched them unfold on the screen yet again. The depths to which this series plunges into the human psyche is nothing short of extraordinary. The interior and exterior lives of homicide detectives is unlike anything we've seen before. Perhaps it's the length of time we get to see such things in a television series, a large novel-length timeline to capture every little detail with large, sweeping periods of time. 
But the inner lives and lies of the detectives and the internal and external consequences of awful crimes committed by evil beings is given eight glorious hours to mesmerize us on the screen. And more than that, elevating the villains to the same level. True Detective, from this first season on, has set the bar for every crime drama that has come after it. And I'm sorry to say, not a single show or novel or pulp movie has been able to come close to the expectations and standards set by True Detective Season 1. Beginning with the show-stealing performance of Rust Cole by Matthew McConaughey, all the inner turmoil spilling out through the character as perhaps one of the biggest spectacles of character acting in the series. No other portrayal of a fictional homicide detective comes close. The philosophical musings breathe to life through McConaughey's detached, yet animated and stern acting. They express the dark undertones just as well as the long landscape shots and dreary southern mansions could. Even the use of cigarette smoking, these small little objects burning embers, manage to show an emotional point of view. It is unmatched. And Rust Cole is a show-stealing role, if I've ever seen one. And the script appears to know it, giving McConaughey the lead way to shine through off the pages. Marty Hart, the more seasoned and grounded detective played by Woody Harrelson, is often forgotten due to the show-stopping character performance of Rust Cole. But Harrelson's portrayal actually gives the show an emotional depth that often goes unseen or unnoticed with the rest of the high-impact action and mystery. I'd go as far as to say Marty Hart is even more important to the story and its winding dips and climbs upward than any other character in the season. His internal family life being a main driver of drama beyond the mystery to be solved the struggles faced at the domestic level offer viewers the meat of the matter, the true in True Detective. Without Harrelson, there would be very little subplot. And of course, without his character losing his temper easily, there would be very little tension between the two detectives in those iconic scenes of them driving through the barren, seemingly endless landscapes of southern Louisiana. The dynamic between his children, his wife, his work, his partner, his weaknesses, are what give this show depth, and even, dare I say, perhaps a little light to juxtapose the dark philosophical musings on death and such from Rust Cole. Without these distinct character differences, the show would be lost, or even an NCIS or CSI level crime drama. Meaning, these two men, being opposites of one another, is what gives us the rich dynamic of two men, partners attempting to do good, who don't quite get along, no matter how hard they try. The tension is always there, and it is written into the scripts brilliantly, and portrayed on screen brilliantly. Sure, Cole has his own struggles with family, but they are only ever talked about through dialogue. His long monologues on life and death and humanity. We aren't shown the dynamics like we are for Marty Hart. The daily struggles he slogs through to keep his family together and his ability to let his moral compass be compromised whenever the right amount of anger surges through him or for the right piece of ass. All this is to say Marty Hart and Harrelson's depiction of him on screen is the everyman of the series. He isn't dark and complicated and well-versed in the great philosophers the way McConaughey's Cole is, but normal, even carrying a pot belly, and privy to the important surface-level interactions that make up everyday life. His character is what brings the contrast, the straight man, to the unusually dark and brooding character of Rust Cole. Without it, the show would not work. 
It could never work without both components being there on the screen at all times. The natural tension in the two different men only adding to the many layers of drama and complexity this show managed to capture. I hesitated to even review this show because I found myself only praising what I had seen a few times now on screen. But as it goes, the latest season with a new creator and showrunner dropped in 2024, and I fell sick for about a week with little else to do. So I began to rewatch all the seasons of True Detective as I laid on my sofa, unable to do much else but lay there and watch. And this first season is breathtaking. It actually made me miss living in Louisiana. A feeling of longing for the swamps that only ever occurs to me very sparingly. I only lived in southern Louisiana for three years while I was in graduate school at McNeese, a school that Pizzolatto attended briefly before going to Arkansas for his own MFA. But when living in that part of the country, it is hard not to fall in love with the rugged charm of the area, its isolated location and culture. Many of the inhabitants still speaking a Cajun dialect of French. The accents of even the minor actors just brought back memories of being unable to understand shopkeepers and locals when I first moved down there from my city boy roots. Every shot that showed the I-10 signs and exit ramps heading toward Orange and then Beaumont back toward Baton Rouge, I was filled with nostalgia for that part of my life. The accuracy in the depiction is what I'm praising here, dear listeners. It is accurate, and it captures the painful beauty of the land down there in the American South. The people, the food, the smells of gas and oil and chemical processing plants in the morning swamp waters, all of it. I grew to love these parts of the country, live in them. Be a part of them with a culture that was foreign to me when I first encountered it. And this show captures that better than most. Better than almost any other depiction of that area I've seen. This is in large part due to Pizzolatto's writing, but also to Kerry Joji Fukunaga's directing. And he is the sole director for every episode of this first season. Another great move by HBO and Pizzolatto as the showrunner to help create a clear tone that pulls the viewer throughout. Fukunaga made a clear and very successful attempt to capture the landscapes, make the setting a character of the show, haunt the viewer with the plants and open spaces and towers billowing smoke. The setting is part of the ghost that haunts every shot. The mystique of the southern swamplands, the legends and ghost stories within them, is what brings the true nature of the setting to life. The plot, the actual story, its twists and turns are all enhanced by Fukunaga's direction choices. Long shots of barren landscapes, chemical plants, oil fields, even more than the man-made structures, the erosions on the coastlines of Louisiana, the fading landscapes caused by nature and man alike, the little pieces that evaporate and turn to swamp, ocean water, as the story progresses and the characters age over 20 years. These aspects of setting and landscape become one of the most important parts of the story, not just in solving the crime, but in the atmosphere and tone of the entire production. Even this, the setting, is unmatched by every crime drama that has come after it. Without this added element from Fukunaga, the show would not have had the same impact that it did. It would feel a little empty, hollow, a crime show like NCIS, simply moving from setting to setting or office building to office building, the landscape unimportant. And this richness of landscape 
the way the endless swamps and bayous and miles and miles of dirt parish highways that connect it all to one another makes certain we as viewers know exactly where we are and anticipate each new development as the story unfolds. The people, even the minor characters that are barely on screen for more than a few seconds, enhance the series. The rural way of life, the trailers, the fishing culture, etc. is all a very deservingly praised aspect of this show that lets us see interiors of even the smallest of characters and voiceless extras that populate the screen. The economic devastation, another silent yet poignant character in the series. The glossy sweat that clings to each actor's collarbones the instant they step outside into the humid stew that is southern Louisiana. I can't praise the series highly enough. It's been written about and talked about to death in the last decade, ever since it aired all those years ago in 2014, and changed the shape and direction of prestige crime dramas forever. I merely wish to make my contribution in its ever-growing and well-deserved praise. The writing, the acting, the directing, the cinematography, all of it. And the ending, while controversial and leading some to be disappointed, is also a mark of praise for the series. Complicating the character arcs up until the very last second of runtime. And re-watching it for what I believe to be the third time now, I found the ending almost heartwarming. Cole's existential crisis, the dying and coming back to life, his determined atheism being questioned, his will to live being renewed in a very complex and even unclear way. It adds a layer of complexity that lets us see Cole in a very different state, a less cynical state, a state where he is wrong and questions himself for the very first time in the series. And it is almost poetic to have it occur in the very last five minutes of the season. Cole tends to always be right, his hunches always leading to some form of discovery, finding the answers, doing the hard work of piecing the puzzle together. But in that final scene, he's broken, and not by anything small, either. His life's philosophy shattered with a near-death experience. His entire foundation shaking as he comes away from the case that has haunted him for over 20 years. It is this type of emotional register in the show that elevates it over all the others. I'm not one for believing in God, dear listeners, as many of you will already know. But I think many tend to belittle the drama at play when losing or gaining faith. The internal struggle that must be captured and depicted by the writing and acting and directing that comes with both is not so easy to portray. The collapse of certainty. I think many were disappointed with the first season's ending merely because it came to an end. This pulse-pounding, exhilarating thriller coming to a conclusion, when many of us, myself included, wanted it to continue on forever. The teasing out of each unraveling was so masterfully done, I just didn't want it to end. And I think the critics of the ending wanted the show to be something else, a supernatural thing, even which would have ruined the carefully constructed tone and atmosphere. As the saying goes, all good things end. And True Detective Season 1 does it with an existential bang. What else can be said? It sets the bar. And nothing has ever come close since. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber 
at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. The second season of True Detective, originally airing in 2015, was greeted to what I will call mixed reviews when it first premiered almost a decade ago. And I readily admit, dear listeners, that I was a member of the crowd that did not like it when it first aired. In fact, I found it boring and slow, a little bloated even. I would even be the first to admit that it felt a little empty when I first watched its eight hours all the way back in 2015. I couldn't help but compare it to the first season, how stellar and revered it was. And sure, that's my fault. My clarity of vision was clouded by my love and adoration of the first season, its atmosphere, its characters. But upon rewatching season two for the first time since it aired all those years ago, I found myself having a change of heart and mind. I was absolutely consumed by the plot, its intricacies, absolutely consumed. I found myself excited to watch each episode, the next and then the next, as I binged the entire season three or four hours at a time. And of course, this led me to reflect on my initial feelings I harbored after the first watch all those years ago. Why I didn't see this quality before why I wasn't gripped by it the first time around, but was the second time. After thinking about it for a while, I concluded that it may have been because I, and everyone else who slandered the second season of True Detective, was comparing it too heavily to the first season. After all, the first season was so good, so enticing, so well made, so unlike anything we had seen before in crime dramas, that I was expecting another season one. In fact, hoping for it, begging for it even. As I already mentioned in my review of season one, I found myself disappointed with the ending on the first watch because I didn't want it to end. I wanted it to entertain me forever. And for season two, I think I was leaning too heavily on expecting another season one. And when the show began to air in 2015, I was immediately disappointed that it wasn't another season one, but something else entirely. I admit now, in hindsight, which is always easier to see with, that I had high expectations after that debut season of True Detective the critically fawned over drama with McConaughey and Harrelson. And my desire to go on the same roller coaster ride again was what I had set my sights on. But watching it again, almost a decade later, I've come to see the errors of my initial impressions. In fact, I go as far as to applaud Nick Pizzolatto, the show's creator and only writer, for not falling into the trap of giving the audience what it wanted or expected. So much is said of, quote, giving the audience what they want, but as an artist, it can be suffocating and even force a wrong turn or a repeat of what was previously seen, something so many crime drama series fall victim to. Instead, Pizzolatto gave us a new story with a new setting and new characters all showing themselves on screen. And I now think this was a brilliant artistic move to make, not only to help separate each season, giving each one its own standalone plot and feel, but also make clear to the audience and fans that there would be no repeat of season one a clear and decisive statement that each season would be its own self-contained story, 
almost perfectly contained within the short eight-episode seasons. It was a statement, an artistic one and a personal creative one. A statement of Pizzolatto's own prowess as a storyteller and writer, but also of his wide breadth of ability. I'm afraid I can't say plainly enough how wrong I was on my initial viewing of True Detective Season 2. However, I will say that the first two episodes of Season 2 were slow much slower than the pilot for season one, which differs from the standard pulp formula. Where we don't see the dead body, the thing that sparks the entire story and investigation in season two, until the very end of the first episode, as opposed to the standard pulp formula, like in season one, where the dead body that sparks the investigation is one of the first things we see. Showing the viewer the thing that starts the story is always an important step. As the pulp greats would often say, step one is to kill someone in an unusual way. And I have no doubt that Pizzolatto <clears throat> was toying with subverting this formula somewhat. But it only draws out the initial chain of events. After the first episode, and partway through the second episode... I did find myself thinking that my initial judgments of the second season were perhaps correct, but then the story got going, and what I settled on as the weakness of this second season, which, of course, I think is less of a weakness than I previously did, is the amount of main characters the show follows. This ends up being a strength as well by the time we get to the end of the eight episodes, but the first hour and a half or so of it, well, really took some time to set up. Having this many characters forces the first hour or so to introduce us to all of them. And I don't fault Pizzolatto for this. My guess would be that he wanted to not only challenge himself with more characters and a story with more moving parts, which is to be applauded, in my view, but to also challenge the viewer, the fans, the pulp fiction lovers, and frankly, he pulled it off in a pretty satisfying way. He even made it clear that season two was an homage to the prolific crime novelist James Elroy and his doorstop pulp novels about Los Angeles and Southern California. As many critics have pointed out, season two even lifts a few plot lines from Elroy's novel, The Big Nowhere, part of his L.A. Quartet, which I recommend to all crime and pulp lovers out there to read at least once. But really, all that is taken from Elroy's novel is the dead body and how it is removed from the crime scene initially, sparking confusion amongst the investigators as they start to go about solving the case. But as far as criticisms go... Having too many characters for a season of television that only lasts about eight hours or so is one of the larger ones I keep coming back to. Having three main detectives is one too many, even though, and I want to be clear about this, it does work as the story progresses. While I'm listing out my minor quibbles with the story and why I felt it didn't live up to the smoothness and interest of season one, following Frank Semyon, played by Vince Vaughn, one of the somewhat villains in the story, seemed to be asking an eight-episode season of television to do too much. That brings the number of main characters in the show up to four in total. Four main characters that are all involved in the crime story as it unfolds. And here I want to stress that Pizzolatto handles this as well as can be in most instances. As I already tried to make clear, dear listeners... This is a praise of season two. But as those of you who listen to the show regularly will know, I can only be honest about how I felt watching it. Later thinking about where it felt off to me, or why I didn't feel as strongly of a connection to it as I did for season one and season three, which we will get to later, listeners. But I think what many critics of season two had a problem with was exactly what I had a problem with when I first viewed this season as it aired back in 2015. 
they wanted it to be another season one, as I said, the same tone, the same philosophically exuberant detective Rust Cole, musing on the pointlessness of life and dark fascinations and disgusts with the world and humanity as a whole. And this led to the mixed reception as it aired. But I think another stark difference that is under discussed between season one and two and even season three is that season two involves more direct and unapologetic police corruption than the original season one. Ray Velcoro played quite well, if a little over the top at times, by Colin Farrell, is in many ways the star of season two. And he's shown to be an alcoholic, corrupt cop from the very beginning, even beating a journalist and stealing his research and laptop to prevent a story from coming out. Now, this is very much a staple of many pulp stories, and even part of the homage to James Elroy and his huge doorstop crime novels, the police corruption being a prominent theme in all his works. Young, naive cops getting screwed over, as well as cynical veterans cashing in. Not much of a deal breaker, as I said. Season 2 succeeds quite well in its execution. But worth mentioning, I think, that the blatant corruption and dirty cop behavior is less in season one and season three, or at least allows more redemption for the officers and detectives. But after the first hour and a half of a slow start, the show kicks into gear with the task force established in all the crime unfolding. We, as viewers, get to watch and look forward to the little bits of information trickle in, as well as the many facets of the detectives' lives, their inner workings and backgrounds, their secrets. Perhaps the most ridiculed is Rachel McAdams as Detective Annie Bezerides, and some of the criticism I agree with. An example of perhaps the most unneeded part of her storyline is her father, played by David Morse the religious yoga guru who seems relatively forced into the larger plot by a large margin. But McAdams plays it better than I had initially given her credit for. Her acting chops were always there. But the character of Annie herself also seemed a little forced into the story. Almost striking me, as many have pointed out, as a male character that was made into a female by either cultural or studio pressure. Many may forget that even in 2015, the identity politics and diversity and inclusion political obsessions had already become commonplace, where works of art are criticized more for what isn't there than what actually is in the works of art. Television and novels, the first victims of this politically obsessed hysteria that has gripped the world. And, of course, I don't know that to be the case for a fact, but simply base it on the feeling I get when watching her particular parts of the story play out. The way her backstory, compared to all the others, seemed so forced in there that I couldn't help but notice the tonal inconsistencies of the character, still feeling that it was a little out of place, despite enjoying the second viewing much more than the first, to the point where... I now find season two to be underrated and unfairly maligned by critics all those years ago. But, and this is important, listeners, it doesn't ruin the show. It only leads to a few boring scenes that feel a little forced in there. As I said, her yoga instructor hippie father and her cliched problem-having sister, who is shown in the very first episode to be always getting into trouble with things like drugs and prostitution. Farrell, as Velcaro, has one of the most interesting backstories, and his dark inner life really drives the entire plot, much like Marty Hart in season one, and it is perhaps the most deeply written and performed. For example, we see little of Vince Vaughn's Frank Seaman's backstory. Instead, we are told about it through dialogue. But with Velcaro, we get a deeply felt character study, his messy divorce from his wife and his pudgy son, who is shown brilliantly in the series. Velcoro's son and the story behind it lets us, as viewers, question the paternity, 
just like the character of Velcaro himself, wondering if he's really his son or not. His bright red hair and his skittish demeanor are meant to lead us in one direction, but the show ends with the court papers confirming the paternity, that he is, in fact, Velcaro's son. And this is done in a heartbreaking visual move on screen. Brilliant writing. Single little visuals that lay out the discoveries, like all good film and television writing does. Subtle. If you blink, you may miss a pivotal piece of information. And this is part of what makes this entire series so well made and so special in the hearts and minds of fans. This specific attention to detail. And then there is the young gun detective, Paul Woodrow, played stoic and of few words by Taylor Kish. Really a stunningly subtle performance, if not a little stiff at times. But it all comes through by the end of the eight hours. Woodrow is secretly gay going to great lengths to hide his sexuality from everyone in his life, including his mother, friends, co-workers, ex-military buddies, eventually coming back to haunt him, extort his goodwill and do-the-right-thing nature. I have to say, his backstory with the military and his first appearance on the show blew me away watching it for the second time. His subplot and story away from the actual investigations, are dazzling, and why we watch gritty crime dramas like this. His deep character-building scenes become one of the best parts of the show, especially toward the final episodes. His tragic death, committed by corrupted police, after an attempt to blackmail him into submission, is even more moving, and that's something that I think every season of this show doesn't get enough credit for just how moving each character's story is, just how emotionally resonant and clear. Each new piece of information complicates them in such a great way it's hard to describe what it adds to the series as a whole. In fact, it's the beating heart of the first three seasons. It's what separates True Detective from all the other crime shows and movies that have come before it. And this is why it has set the bar for all the crime shows and movies that have come after it. I'll admit, even after rewatching and enjoying season two much more than the first time around, one thing many critics of the season may have gotten right is Vince Vaughn's performance. Now, I'm a big fan of Vaughn in almost everything he's done, but it does seem to me as though he didn't have the acting chops for a role like this. The rest of the cast were really outshining him. The most glaring is his monologue in bed with his wife in episode two. The rats in the cellar was perhaps one of the cringiest monologues in the entire series. That is, until season four was introduced recently, but we will get there shortly. Dear listener, perhaps it was the actual material of the monologue that made me cringe, but I think it has more to do with Vaughn's limitations as an actor than anything else. He can play bad, sure, but the depth this character required from the actor was a little more presence on screen, especially in the more violent scenes where he tortures and threatens many of his underlings that have betrayed him out of his land deal, a deal he had staked his retirement and entire life on. But the show holds its own, despite the little hiccups that occur here and there. As I said, this many characters might have required a full 10-episode season to include everything. But apart from a slow start, and this is only compared to the usual fast pace of crime thrillers, the show manages to tie all the loose ends up in a great shootout scene among the Redwoods in California, with Farrell really turning up the volume on his performance when he leaves an emotional voice message for his son as he's being chased down by the corrupt cops after him. Pizzolatto seems to have an ear for dialogue, and season two doesn't disappoint in that front either. It's remarkable especially in the elevation of simple scenes like two cops driving together in a car and talking. The exchanges are often on another level, 
again, giving homage to the pulp greats, the snappy back and forths that the genre has come to be known for. And more importantly, season two doesn't fall victim to the cliches that so many crime dramas seem to fall victim to. There is very little expected that isn't subverted by wildly original storylines. Vaughn's death scene in the desert after the cartel shoots him and leaves him to bleed out in the middle of nowhere is one of the strongest scenes in the series. Vaughn marching on, bleeding out, and telling his many hallucinations from his past to go fuck themselves, fighting until his very last step. We will get to the final rankings of each season in part two of this review, dear listeners, explaining my thoughts in detail about where I think each season stands. But I'd rank season two just below season one and three, which we will get to, but that is only because the bar is so high. And season one and three are perhaps some of the best crime television ever made. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard.